Divine Truth Training Material Training material generated by Jesus, Mary and others for assorted topics and projects. In the second part of the Introduction to Environmental Recovery Training, Jesus gives an impromptu introduction to the subject of environmental recovery to invited guests and discusses the necessity for action, multi-generational destruction of the environment, the recovery cycle, sustainable recovery, and introduces the ideas of learning from God and utilizing plants, organisms, and ways to support full environmental recovery. The training was recorded on the 4th of January 2017 from 1 p.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. So, um, for those who were here this morning's presentation, what would be a natural thing for me to do now? Ah, to revise some of our points, right? So, our points were, we've seen the process of environmental destruction. You can see that it's happened over millennia. You can see what happens is that by eating down the, the gr seeds that are growing, we end up with no edible plants in the system and no recovery plants in the system aside, uh, no nitrogen fixing plants in the system because they're all edible generally. And we only end up with weeds in the system and we only end up with those as long as no erosion has occurred, whether that be wind or, or water-based erosion. So then we've got to go through a recovery process which is going to involve trying to get water back onto the land somehow or storing water somehow. It's going to require soil you know to be produced if it's not there or some intelligence in the soil to produce the soil and to do that we need these living creatures and we need to give them food and a home otherwise they're not going to be able to exist and then we need to encourage these weeds to grow because that's going to start the process of recovery off and then of course once the weeds are growing we need to reintroduce some recovery organisms of a higher type but some of those recovery organisms of a higher type are edible and it's highly unlikely in long-term destruction that those are actually there in that environment anymore as seeds. And so that's where you might have to bring some seeds in from other places. But seeds are, they are able to be produced at any time, are they not? You just let a plant go to seed. Every year generally plants go to seed. So it's a, it's a resource that is renewable. So you can take seeds from one area that's renewable that, that is renewing those seeds and put those seeds in another area that needs them can't you yeah, quite easily all right so we have this process that we've got to encourage and what our focus is now is what well, how do we do that how do we encourage it well you can see that it depends a bit on the environment doesn't it the environment that you're left with so for example if you had a sandy hot environment with very little water it would be different than if you had a sandy cold environment with a lot of water but still being destroyed and that would be different than if you had a rocky hot environment and that would be different than if you had a rocky cold environment with more water and that would be different than if you had a clay hot environment or a clay cold environment and that would be different if you actually had some topsoil that's either hot or cold so wouldn't it yeah. this is all assuming there's no or little topsoil and then even if there is topsoil of course that topsoil could be very damaged so what you see all the way through here for example with the farming communities the topsoil is very damaged now if you bring that topsoil to a place and you just let it sit there the very the only thing that will grow in that topsoil is weeds so it's already damaged so you know we've done some experiments where we brought topsoil where somebody was getting rid of some topsoil some red soil and so we want to do some experiments so bring some of that topsoil here and dump them in a place and we've had five years of weeds only on that topsoil and it's interesting because sometimes the load of topsoil is dumped like that on top of the ground all the water is running off still right and yet that is like weeds everywhere just on that soil and nowhere else <laughs> right 
which is an indication that while the topsoil might be fertile enough to grow weeds, it obviously isn't fertile enough to grow much else uh, because of the destruction that's occurred to it. Uh, we've also got piles of manure that we got from a, um, what do you call them, a feedlot, uh, which is where they, where they put cattle into a very tight area and just feed them grain and they just get all their manure and one year I decided get some of that manure and let's see what it's like. We leave it in a pile. I've left that now in a pile for six years and it still it produces weeds. Still. Yep. Yes. So if you wanted uh, a whole bunch of weeds on your property because yours wasn't producing any weeds, could you just grab some of that stuff and put it in different areas of your of place course you so could. they could see different weeds? Well, of, of course you could, yeah. yeah. Yep. Again, grab stuff that other people are chucking away, <laughs> put it on your property, understand the system, put it on the property. It's going to do something, right? It's going to recover some things. Yep. So obviously the soil is different. If the soil is different, you need to do different things. That's important to understand. A problem with sandy soil, obviously, is the water might rain on the, on the soil, but because it's sandy, it will leach through the soil and go right down into the water table and it won't stay there. So somehow you've got to get the water to stay there, higher up. Otherwise, no plants can grow. On rocky soil, obviously, the, so the, the sand, again, the, 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 the uh, water might hit the soil, but a lot of it's going to run off. And the bit that doesn't run off is going to run down the crevices of the rocks and again run probably down, depending how porous that is, into the water table. Which often, because of this destruction process, is quite low, unfortunately. Clay-based soil, what's going to happen is you have the water come down, it hits the soil, but because it's clay and nothing can penetrate it and water finds it very hard to penetrate clay, it, it will run off very rapidly, right? And won't even go down into the soil. So that it's a different problem for each thing. So you need to work out what the problems are. We need to keep the water on, so we need to come up with solutions of how to keep the water on in different Things. Now, you can see in some situations where, where it might be cold and rainy all the time, like wet and clay, we might need to let water run off rather than retain water. Because nothing can grow if it's just water. There needs to be soil along with water for something to grow. Right? So we might need to let somehow drain it somehow do something to make it drain whereas on a hot climate you want to keep the water there you don't want to have the water run away because it's all going to evaporate eventually anyway and you'll end up with none so you've got to do different things for different situations so our, our situation here is clay and hot or rocky and hot they are our two primary issues that we have here corny's property similar to that rocky and hot clay or hot generally that's the place with uh, Peter and Eloise's um, it's probably a bit less clay but it's still rocky and hot um, and you go down to the learning centre down the bottom it's more sandy and hot uh, if you go up the side of the mounds it's more sort of rocky or clay and hot <laughs> the further you go up it just depends what, what's the problem where the beauty of clay, in particular, is that it stores water for long periods of time without running away. So you can use that to your advantage. Everything that's a disadvantage generally has advantages. So you can work with the disadvantages um, by improving them, but you can use the advantages you have to improve the disadvantages. So what have we done here? Well, the first problem is water. First problem is water, all of our water running off. Um, every year, that's all that happened. Sometimes I've, I've seen the, creek, the creeks here, just from the area, catchment area, if you stood in it, you, you would be sucked out and down to the river. That's how huge the water flow is. Like huge amounts of water, sometimes in a big rain. 
but, it, but it's all just running off the property. And then when you try to dig into the ground, into the clay, the top part, you know, this top 10 mil or so is, is muddy. And then under that's just dry. And then it was all that water that just ran down the hill into the, and into the, well, in the end, it ends up in Australia, if we're where we are, into the interior of Australia. Just all ran away. <laughs> all right, so what do we do about that? Obviously, um, if we've got clay, there's a lot of things we can do with it because clay stores water. If we make a bowl, we can store some water. Right? What we did was decided to start making bowls. So the first project I did was 200 bowls. They were the size of two metres wide, two metres, a metre and a half deep. And I just did 200 of them, 200 bowls. And they were made, on the slopes of the soil, they were made this way where they were, a hole was dug there and then a mound was put there. So when the water came down, it would fill up the hole. And eventually, of course, if it was too much, it would run over. But there's only one time that there's been too much. The whole time we've been here. Mm. But now we've got a hole with nothing in it. <laughs> and all the insides of that hole up here, all bare baked land, that's a problem because it's just going to bake and bake and bake, isn't it? And there's, on this side, there's going to be no water at all. Here, there's going to be water, but it's all going to evaporate very rapidly. How do we stop it from evaporating? We've got to put something in it. <laughs> Don't we? So what we did was put in, so here's our hole. We put a bale of cardboard in it that we have got from the local their rubbish. And then we just poured as much, we've got as much debosia as we can handle. And we filled that hole up with a mound like that with debosia, which is a, which is a, a thing that's grown here for medical, for the medical profession. Um, but the reality is that it's also a recovery plant. It's a nitrogen fixing plant as well. But we're just getting the offshoots of it, the offcuts. What they do is they dry it all out and get extract every little bit of juice out of it because that's what they use uh, for, you know, to, to sell. And then they're left with all this dry softwood. Uh, piles and piles of it, mounds of it. The very first time I found a mound of it, it was 3,000 cubic metres of it. Right? No, it was 6,000 cubic metres, that's right. And a guy come to me and said, um, do you want our mound? <laughs> 6,000 cubic metres. Uh, if you put out in truckloads, it's a, a double bogey truck, so a truck with a trailer, a trailer behind it, a big truck with a trailer behind it is 20 cubic metres. So that's 300 of those of the Bosier. He said, I could have the lot for six grand. Well, that wasn't the problem, was it, obviously? It's carting it. <laughs> carting it to here, off of his property, that's the problem. It costs a lot more than six grand to do that. 300 truckloads at $100 a truckload is how much? $30,000 in cartage. <laughs> so the first project cost $36,000. That's a fair bit, isn't it, really? Yeah. David? So the idea would be to understand the principles that you're saying and then logically try to solve the problem in our respective territories. Yes. Yep. Now, obviously, this person was chucking away all this stuff. And I thought, oh, this is a good experiment. I can grab this stuff and see what it does. So, and because... I've eaten meat in my life. I sort of see $36,000. Well, that, that's due compensation on my part for my eating of meat. Do you see what I'm saying? Like the fact is that I've destroyed, through the eating of meat, I've destroyed probably many, many acres of land. And uh, part of this compensation is now investing some of my money and time into fixing up the land I've destroyed, you see? So that's why I chose to do it. The average person probably wouldn't do it, right? They'd spend their thirty-six thousand dollars on a new car or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Which is more taking from the land, actually, isn't it? More taking from the resources. Yeah. 
So we've got to have some desire to do something about it, obviously, and, and that desire has to translate in a willingness to do something about it that's sincere. Otherwise, we're not going to do anything about it. But I, I just did it as an experiment. The beauty of the experiment was all the water came, when the water rained, when it rained, the holes filled up with water. It took nine months for that water to go away. So before the water was running off on the day that it came, and for the water to go out of the bottom of the hole, I've measured, I've measured some of the holes, nine months. Interesting, hey? So what started to happen straight away? Around the holes, the edible recovery plants started growing straight away. They had water nine months of the year, and the other three months was rain anyway. So they had water all the year round. So when I first came here, there was like, and I don't know if Cornelius probably was saying, but you could walk over the whole property and just push over dead wattle everywhere. Did you, did you find that on your property? Here, that's what it was like. You, I finished up pushing over like thousands of dead wattle because they'd all grown, but there wasn't enough water and that all died. You follow me? And wattle are recovery plants, so the second generation recovery. And that all died. And that all died just as little saplings like this, or you know, some of them were about as high as the ceiling. And you could just go along and push them over, because they were all dead, of course, and you just push them over. Thousands of them everywhere, push them all over everywhere, onto the ground, because I wanted on the ground rather than standing up still. So that's what I did. Now, you'd be very hard pressed to go and push any wattle over that's dead on the property at all. Right? And you know how they say, or in Australia here, they say that wattles only live for five to ten years on the average or something. Well, I've had wattles here that are now huge, healthy trees almost that I, I saw grow uh, from, from, the to from the whole time I've been here. They're still growing. And uh, yeah, I've been here 10, 11 years now. And they, they're not looking like they're going to die anytime soon. Uh, uh, was it during the lunch discussion I was asking about um, for other places in the world that don't have debosier, was it any type of softwood that well, would work the, for that type of mulch? The idea is to get uh, softwood or hardwood, doesn't matter. Okay. Any type, uh, and you want to get the rubbish of other people where possible, so you want to get as much decomposable rubbish. Like, See, see in many countries, including the US, they don't separate rubbish, right? So you've got decomposable rubbish, and then you've got your plastic-based rubbish, and a lot of places in America still don't separate it. Yeah, Some depends do. on the place. But, but if you can separate it, and you can get all that rubbish, no matter how smelly it is, and dig a hole and put it in there, right? now you've got food for your, and a home for your intelligence, haven't you? Mm. Food and a home for intelligence. Yep. So one of the things we've been doing, and Pete's still doing, you'll see he goes into town twice a week and gets the rubbish that's decomposable from Anderson's, which is all like vegetable rubbish, and just pours it in the holes. <laughs> Covers it a bit over with the bows so it doesn't smell. And there's the hole prepared for uh, food and home for intelligent creatures. Yep. Pete? It's interesting with the scraps because one of the first things that come in are all the ants. Like yep. the ants are just like, oh, desperate. Mass. massive. It's insane yeah. watching them. It's yeah. really yeah. cool. Yeah. And then, of course, you get all sorts of things following them in. And then, of course, you get a lot of insects coming in. And then, of course, you get the birds that eat those insects coming in. And then you get the lizards that eat the insects coming in. And then you get the birds that eat the lizards coming in. And then, like, it all just <laughs> the, it, it becomes a cycle that you've now created, like a little ecosystem. But, but it all had to begin with having a food and a home for the things in the soil that are going to provide intelligence to the system. Yep. Catherine. So ants are the first recovery insects. Oh, are they? they are a recovery insect, but they're not the first. Um, there are many recovery insects, um, mo most of which are actually buried in the soil already in a state of stasis, uh, waiting for the appropriate resources to be present in the soil before they can actually grow and come out of stasis and therefore multiply. So 
and there's a lot of tiny little insects, uh, you know, like sort of little midges and gnats and all those kind of little insects that even uh, are sort of way before the ants themselves, are much smaller than the ants. And in fact, the ants use them for food um, oh. as a part of their food system. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Of course, the ants are good because they, the ants are interesting because they, they have protection from the heat. So, so, and they also usually, more than other creatures, can survive hotter climates. So therefore, you know, in a really damaged climate, you want your ants there and you definitely want to pr provide the homes for them as well. Yeah. But they are just a part of the intelligence. So of course, there's literally thousands of creatures that are a part of the intelligence. Wayne? So with the swale, would it be better to put the debosia in the swale too to stop that evaporating quicker? In any swale? Yeah. 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 A swale, for those who don't know, is just basically, uh, uh, if you imagine a, so a hill like that, sometimes people will build a swale like that and then another swale down. And, it t and they just build swale, and what happens is the water does collect there. But it's far better if you put some matter there on top of that, and the water still collect there, but the matter will keep the water there for longer. So that means below there, there will be a flow of underground water. So that's what we're finding with these. There's a flow of underground water down that hill. So now when we dig up those, those holes, and some of them are still needing to be replenished but, um, because the matter is decomposed, but when we dig up those holes now, there's a whole heap of tree, different tree roots and everything. All, they've all come there to get the water. You know what I mean? Because um, there's no other place they can go to get the water, and that's where they need to go. Yep. So th but the holes were quite small. Um, like that we first experimented with, um, and, but they work. So um, Mary only wanted to do a test of about ten holes or so. But, um, wasn't that about right? Maybe a bit worried about the whole process, but 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 it only took two days for an excavator to do the two hundred holes. So I thought, yeah, might as well do the two hundred holes. <laughs> He just did as many holes as he could. And what we did is we chose locations for the holes where the ground was completely bare, where there was nothing growing at all. So, so wherever something was growing, we left that line, and wherever something wasn't growing, we dug a hole. And when I say nothing growing, there was no weeds or anything growing, you know, it's just bare. So we dug a hole. Dug a hole, filled it up with rubbish. And the rubbish included like some um, great big bales of cardboard, um, which, by the way, is just and the world is produced so much, you know, and there's huge amounts of it, obviously dumped all the time. Some of it now is recovered and re redone, but not a lot, you know. A lot of it just gets dumped. And uh, in the end, we probably have picked up 200 bales of cardboard or more. Well, probably more than that because it's 200 holes and most holes had a bale of cardboard in them. And then we did a little area, a larger area, where we've put at least 50 bales. So we probably picked up 300 bales or more of cardboard. And we've done the, uh, you know, getting the plant stuff from the offshoot of all the fruit and veg from Anderson's for years, you know, a couple of years longer. They love it because they don't have to have, they don't have to pay for people to come and do their rubbish for them. We go and do it for them, you know. Initially it was us and now it's Pete and Eloisa doing it. Um, they love it because they don't have to pay for somebody to get rid of their garbage. Uh, before they were having to pay for somebody to get rid of their garbage or before then and before then what happened was that they were putting it on their own property but some of their animals got sick and then and the and they were stopped from putting it on their own property. So, But this way we bury it. There's no danger of any animals getting sick or anything, is there? It's all just going to go into the soil. Yeah, lots of moisture in that too. Yeah. <laughs> Another thing that happened was that uh, we have a wood mill close by in Wondai and, and one of their big 
uh, piles of excess wood, wood dust and wood offshoots and so on, so on, so all caught alight. And, and, and the fire went on for days and days and days, and eventually an inspector came in and said, look, if you don't get rid of this pile, we're going to shut you down. <laughs> right? And so now they're in a panic to get rid of their pile. Right? So they would give away their pile. So, oh, I heard about that. You're going to give away their pile. I'll take it. <laughs> you know. So I got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cubic metres of hardwood um, as well and put that down and around the roads and all sorts of things, stop erosion, and it's worked really well. Right. So, so what this does is it creates an environment now where we've got food, decomposing matter, food for the intelligence, the insects and the uh, organisms in the soil, and we've got a home for the plants and a home for literally thousands of things now, insects, spiders, lizards, um, and also all of the organisms like bacteria and so forth all now have a home in that particular area. It's like a little busy place to, to start recovery. Mm. So what I've decided after a while was those holes were too small. And so we dug some big ones. So one big one we dug out the back of our house was about it's more like the size of this room, eight metres across. And we've been filling that up with matter for nearly three years. <laughs> and it's still not full. <laughs> yeah, just slowly filling it up, filling it up, filling it up. And it's still, still filling it up. But when we go out there, there is literally teeming with life. Like birds there all the time, animals there all the time. The kookaburra just sits on top of the fence looking at what's going on there because that's all he has to do. So all the birds that eat insects and eat creatures are all fat and happy. <laughs> right? So they're all surviving now. There, there's some recovery there going on inside the soil. And so now we've got some things going there. And I decided, oh, well, that's probably a bit small. So what we did was we dug two big trenches <laughs> that are about uh, six foot deep six foot wide and 30 metres long and we're filling up those slowly as well and they've been uh, trenched uh, again on the slope of the land so so all the water falls in there now if you go down to the bottom of those trenches no matter how long it's dry it's always wet down the bottom no matter how long it's dry there's always water there when we first dug it it was six, it was six to eight feet deep and there was not a drop of water in it, even at eight feet deep. Uh, no water at all, it's all clay. No water at all. Now there's water there all the time. So sooner or later, we, once we get some, if we get a decent rain, that will fill up with water. And once we've got some water in there, now we've got some room to get some other things going. But there's already an ecosystem in there, there's already organisms, food and a home for pl animals and creatures that recover the soil, all there now. And as a result, they're doing their work anyway, already. There's already water, enough moisture for them to survive, even though we've had very little rain. So now they're in recovery. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's how we've kept water on the property. And it also has the effect of benefiting the soil, as um, a lot of people will tell you that there's a difference between decomposition and composting. Composting is where you put enough water and enough dry whatever goods into a mix and you get it so that it generates a huge amount of heat and as it generates heat there's a lot of organisms that are attracted by that heat and, and, and moisture and it breaks down very rapidly and turns into very nice soil afterwards. Right? The problem with the composting process is that God doesn't do it. Um, it obviously there are natural processes at work in the composting process, which God has allowed for, but in a normal forest situation, composting is not what occurs. What occurs is decomposition, which is a very slow release and change from a material into soil. Very slow over a long period of time. And the beauty of doing a slow over a long period of time is that it supports the rest of the ecosystem. Whereas if you do composting, it doesn't support the rest of the ecosystem. 
It's very, very rapid, very quick. So you get your instant results that you're looking for, which is most, what most people are looking for, but you're not getting a long-term benefit to the entire ecosystem. Connie? Yep. I did an experiment with that just to try it out too. It had a big pile, like a haystack sort of pile. Yeah. And followed some way to do it, someone mentioned. Yeah. And took over a month to do it. I broke it down to really nice soil, but I was just hating it because there's so much physical work to do it. Yeah, it turning it over all the time. Yeah. And, yeah. and um, I found out, I put it around trees and stuff like that and just watched what it was doing. Yeah. And I found out it wasn't holding the waters like I thought it would. It's just soil. It Correct. It hasn't got the um, stuff that all the little creatures in the life actually do when they break it down. Because no life's there because the heat gets rid of the life. Exactly. Yeah. So it doesn't actually do any good in the end anyway. No. no. The heat in composting process gets rid of the life and therefore gets rid of the intelligence out of the system. So it's still getting rid of intelligence, not adding intelligence. Compo decomposition adds intelligence to the system. The life is there causing the destruction of that matter over a long period of time. And, and as a result, there's a huge amount of life in that process, as you know, from your experiments. And, and that's why compost is not anywhere near as good as decomposition. That's what I found. I was wondering what the difference was. And it's what the animals or creatures make. It's like the humus, which is the one that holds all the water retention in the soil. It's their excrement, it's basically. Yeah, it's like microscopic stuff. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So it's really the excrement of the intelligent creatures that create the good soil for you to produce life in the long run. It's, it's not actually the soil itself that you're interested in. It's all the additional things that are in the soil that you're interested in. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Bart. So somebody who's just got a small house block, instead of having your compost pile up the back, dig some holes and just put your stuff in. Yep. Yep, it's going to have much more long-term benefit. It's going to decompose over a long period of time. It's going to bring all those organisms back into the soil. They are they're going to you know have their their waste, and that waste is what is going to produce the soil that you can actually now um, grow things in and in a sustainable manner. Yep. Besides the fact that a compost is a, is as Courtney said, hard work. <laughs> You've got to turn it over regularly. You've got to measure its moisture content and measure its heat and, and all these kind of things. You don't have to do that with decomposition. It's just a natural process. If you do composting, it's a, it's a control process that you now have to work for. And you think about it. The economy principle, anything you've got to work for and maintain, obviously is not in harmony with what God intends in the long run. And there's reasons. Right? So composition, decomposition is what you're aiming for. So, so when it go, something goes into composting, you stop it, <laughs> rather than feeding it, you know. Tris? I've currently got a uh, scraps, like, uh, it's, it's supposed to be like a compost, but it's, I've just used it as in a scraps place to so put the scraps and yeah. let them de decompose over time. Um, there is usually lots of things happening in there. Of course. Um, but I've noticed that after a rain, Everything like quickly de decomposes, and then there's hardly anything in in there life-wise after. That's that. right, because uh, after a rain, you get a lot of moisture in there. As soon as you get a lot of moisture in there, it ends in, enters the composting phase, where it generates heat. Yeah. Once it generates heat, it now gets rid of any life in there, and and all the goodness generally after the rain will run out of it as well, because it's above the ground. Yep. It's not in the ground, so you want it in the ground. You want the process in the ground, and, and not on top of the ground. And have a bit of a covering over the top so it doesn't get blasted on the on the top, or. Yeah, well, if you can dig a hole, it's better. Yep. Just put it in the ground. You know, that's the that's the real thing we want to achieve. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. David. And this would be different for a sandy, hot environment altogether? Well, there are a lot of principles that are the same. But with a sandy, hot environment, you've got not much rain and very porous soil. So digging a hole is going to help, right? But you need to put something over the top of it, don't you? But, but once the water comes in, in sandy soil, even at the bottom of the hole, it's just going to go away, isn't it? Mm. So you really want something that's going to be able to catch the water and leave it there for a long time don't you can you see that mm. so how do you produce clay in a sandy soil does anybody know the answer to that no idea <laughs> that'll be it um could you use um say some things like 
like your sponge system. So you could use like, say, cardboard or... Um, okay, so there's some ways in there. Yep. If the water stays there long enough and we have a hole yep. and the water stays there long enough, if you put something in it that is like a sponge, yep. then that's going to help, isn't yep. it? It's going to mean, mean it soaks up the water and therefore it slowly is going to release the water rather than, rather than rapidly. The alternative is we want to line the yeah. bottom of this with something, don't we? How do we do that? Yeah. What do we do? It has to be something natural, doesn't it? Any ideas, like Pete? Um, farmers often use bennonite as one thing. It's something that expands when it gets moisture in it. What is bennonite? Um, it's, a, it's a type of clay, I assume. Yeah. It's a spray on, spray on clay, clay, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a natural product, but again, you're shipping it in from somewhere else. How do you produce it? Could you use your own poo? Well, your own poo is quite porous, but, but it will help. And I'll, we'll talk about why in a minute. Any other ideas? Can you see it's an experiment you have to engage to find out what? But, but what produces clay? If you, if you, if you, go, you can go to a sandy environment, right? And what you need is a layer of matter that does not decompose very rapidly, don't you? That's really what you need. You need a layer of matter at the bottom of this bowl that doesn't decompose, right? or that decomposes very slowly over a long period of time. Now, you think about waterways that are still and stagnant, which often have a very clay bottom. What's happening at the bottom? Why do they have a clay bottom? What's happened at the bottom of them? Yeah. You want to have a go, Denise? It's been silted up from the organic matter. Right, so there's a lot of organic matter that's silted up. Uh, it, well, it's not silted yet because the silt goes on top of the organic matter, but, the, si but the, the silt can't go below the organic matter. The organic matter is like a layer, isn't it? Like a layer of leaves or a layer of leaves that stop the water from going through it as rapidly. You follow me? Yep. And then the layer of silt builds up on top of that and then you get this real nice clay right, thing on, on top of that and now the water can stay there, isn't it? Isn't that how it works? Yeah. So you've got to replicate that, see? You've got to replicate what God already does. So you've got to learn ways. So sandy soil, that's what you'd have to do. Even rocky soil, that would work on, wouldn't it? Yeah. You want to plug up the holes in the rock and how do you do that? You get a whole heap of organic matter that's slow to decompose because remember, if things are soaking in water, they don't decompose as rapidly as if they have, are exposed to air and water. So what you want is something at the bottom of this that's soaking in water, don't you, over time. That's what you want to aim for. All right. So you'd have to start that in the low areas of the land, wouldn't you? You'd have to find the lowest area of the land, wherever that is, and go, okay, this is the area where I need to start my work. Build up a layer of matter on that area, even if it's just somebody's cardboard that they're throwing away or whatever. <laughs> That'll work, wouldn't it? Just anything that anybody's throwing away, you just put layers of clothes, you know, old cotton clothes or, you know, anything you can think of that, that will just stay there for a long time and not decompose very rapidly in water. All right, Bob? Would old carpets work? Old carpets, as long as they don't have toxins in them, would be the great. Glue, but yeah. even the toxins don't matter too much because it's going to form a basis at the bottom and then there's going to be a layer on top of that, right? And eventually they'll be buffered from the toxins. So, yeah, that would be preferable if it's wool carpet. or. But even if it's nylon, that's going to be okay. It's going to take hundreds of years to decompose. Rather than putting it in landfill, you might as well put it at the bottom of your holes. Right, and, and create a bowl there. And what you want is other matter to go on top of it to form a layer, a, a, a non-porous layer. So when water comes, now it's not soaking into the sand. It's staying there. You see? You just got to think about what God does naturally, what happens naturally, and then you got to replicate that more rapidly. That's what you've got to do. So obviously different techniques will work in different areas. Like I say, some areas have too much water. What are you going to do there? You have to somehow soak it up. How do you soak it up? What does God do there? 
these plants that love water. So you grab them, chuck them in the system. What else do you do? Isn't there a concept of drainage? And we need to look at the concept, how do we drain this area? Now, in, in an area that's the flat at the bottom of something, you can't drain it, can you? So what do you do? You use plants that are going to soak up that water and reuse that water. Yep. In particular, trees will suck up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gallons of water, some trees, in, the, in a day. All right? You, so you think about trying to plant some of those around the place where, where they suck up huge amounts of water. Get, get that water out of the system. If you've got plenty of water in the system, get a bit of it out of the system by having things that grow there. Yep. Denise? It's a very bizarre thought I had, but... Um, the issue of disposable nappies that everybody uses these days. Yep. If, if they were developed so that plastic decomposed rapid, more rapid, yes. would they be a great solution for in there? Because they'd certainly hold Just the water. Just lay them all out there, full yep. of poo or whatever, doesn't okay. matter. <laughs> so we could do a used nappy recycling station. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in, yeah. The, in the desert. Yep. Yeah, yeah. There's huge amounts. Of, of course, people who live in deserts don't normally have nappies, but anyway, <laughs> that might be an issue. But there's all sorts of options you can take, right? There's a lot of things that you can use. It's all going to the soil somewhere anyway, so it might as well go into the soil in your place and be used for a purpose to recover something, right? As long as it's not toxic, it's not going to cause a problem, is it, in the long run, as long as it decomposes over time. And, and, and you want it to decompose over the longest time you can in, in a sandy environment. So in the desert, you want it to decompose over years or tens of years, if possible, to recover a sandy environment. Yeah. So once you've got your bowl and your hole, now it's capable of storing water. Right? Now you fill it up with matter and it's going to store some water and then you can plant some things around it and they'll probably grow, right? Or you can seed around it and just see which seeds grow. The first ones you try are weeds that grow in deserts so you seed all that do that first and they start popping up you know ah soil's good now for those plants you let that happen and then you start adding some other seeds to the do they grow by themselves no well obviously a bit more time's needed and we need to do something else but as soon as the other things start growing a few years later you go now i'm ready let's try some of the nitrogen fixing plants now. Throw a few of those around the hole, see what happens. And you might only start off with a little oasis that's only like two meters wide or something in the middle of the whole <laughs> area that's, and it would remember it's the lowest area of your land. That's where you need to start. Why is that? It's pretty obvious, because all the water runs to the lowest area. It's gonna, that's where you want it to start. You want to stop that area from leaching water in a sandy environment. You want to stop it from giving away your water. That's where all the water's going. That's where you need to stop it. So you start there. You don't worry about doing it on the top of a hill or any of that stuff. That's hard work, you know. You want to work with the environment just like God does. Yep. Any recovery environment you see starts at the bottom generally, naturally because of the flow of water. Mm. So our goal is to, in the recovery process, is to get the intelligence back into the soil first. And then once we've got it in the soil, then we want the intelligence in the layer above the soil. There's the top small layer above the soil. That's the weeds, that process. Once we've got that process, then we want the intelligence in the undercover layer. So we, we, that becomes our process, that becomes our focus. And then after that focus, we want the intelligence in the top layer. And that can be still be recovery plants. And then once we've got all the recovery plants growing in every layer, now we can start adding some other things to the system. Yep. So he and, and also of course you want you want those things happening without your work anymore. So you want to make sure that you've done enough in your planning that there's no more work for all of those things to grow. So, so when I first came here, 
no hardwood, uh, which, are, which are all edible, top layer recovery plants grew by themselves. I tried planting some even and they died. <laughs> uh, and that's why I thought, yeah, well, it's pointless planting something. It's just going to die in the end. <laughs> it was a lot of work for no reason. Now, if you look outside, you'll see three or four saplings, all hardwood, all growing by themselves, and I haven't done anything. Just out the door here. Uh, I have done a lot to the soil, and I've done a lot to the other things, but I haven't done anything to plant them. They've come up by themselves. Now that's a good indication to me. That means the top layer recovery plants, the ones that are really tall, that top layer of recovery plants, which are still all nitrogen fixing, they are now able to grow in my environment by themselves in a very harsh climate, by themselves without hardly any water. In fact, the saplings all came up without any, in a time when there was no rain. That's a good sign. Yeah. So, so that uh, indicates that the now we've got the, all the canopies of the, re the recovery plants able to grow. So now we should start seeing, within the next few years, we should start seeing some more different um, rainforest type recovery plants starting to grow. Stuff that's not normal to grow around here under those circumstances, but would be normal in a rainforest. And sure enough, we've started to see it twice already. Last year and the year before, we've had some of these legumes, that are very vast, fast-growing legume plants that are rainforest legumes, and they've grown to about eight feet high, and they die within, a, w within the same year. They're deciduous. Uh, is that the right, right term? No, the other way. Um, the annuals, and they, they die off every year, but there's a huge amount of pea pods in the seeds, and, the, and it just like rapidly, the next time they grow, there's like <laughs> thousands of them growing, you know, instead of just a few of them. They started off with only about 20 in one area, and I'm expecting when we get a decent rain, we'll have hundreds of them next time. Mm. So that's a good indication that there's things happening there, Catherine. So will ferns and all that start coming back as well? Yeah, we're underneath our tents. Our, we have ferns coming back now. Yeah. yeah. Yep, rainforest plant. Yeah. Mm. They've all started growing underneath the tent, so where it's still a bit wet and moist, and the soil is good enough for them to grow there now, so that's where they're growing, yeah. Yep, Denise? Do you know what the rainforest legumes were? No, I don't know their names or anything. Yeah, yep, just watching them as they go. And yeah, they flower, a nice little yellow, yellow flower. And they, they grow faster than bamboo. It's just like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, within, within uh, you know, within three months, they're eight foot high, 10 foot high. And then they die in the, in the dry but they seed before they die. So all this seed gets dropped on the ground right around them as well. Uh, and they're annuals, but they're flowering and they grow and they seed and they're edible. <laughs> yeah. Not normal here, but yeah. Tris? If this happens uh, around the world, like in different places, do you expect to find a lot of different plants that we've never actually encountered before? Yes. A lot of what they say is that it's extinct, is not actually extinct, it, there's, particularly when it comes to plants. It's all, it's all in the soil, all just waiting for the right conditions. Yeah. Yeah. So there'll be fruits and all sorts of things that we've never seen before grow, yeah. In some cases, like in the Middle East and so forth, there potentially are like, like millions of things we've never seen before. Yeah all in the in the soil particularly if it was rocky soil or clay based soil yep apparently we haven't seen the magnificent colors that are available as well no that's right yeah in australia the reason why our birds here are so colorful is because all the plants were and so they were all camouflaged oh. now all the birds all stand out because the plants are not gone the plants they used to be are not are gone 
that the birds are still producing camouflage. They need to be in an environment for those plants, but now the plants are all just the same colour, so they stand out. Mm. Yeah. Interesting, huh? Yeah. Um, I was digging a few weeks ago in the Brosia pile, yeah. um, and um, very, very deep down, there was um, purple little, little frogs, and they were bright, bright purple. Yes, we've had a huge amount of all sorts of different creatures come that we've never seen before, even. Just a lot of them see are in stasis. Their eggs are in stasis for, uh, often they can be in stasis for decades, and so you create the right environment, and now you create the ecosystem. Yeah. Amazing, eh? Yeah. The key is to do the patient work beforehand, you know, and sometimes costly under the today's circumstances, but um, obviously it wouldn't be costly if we rejigged our lives. You know, if we, if we looked at handling waste much more efficiently, you could see almost every person could have their own little waste manufacturing plant at their own house almost. Um, handling different things see see what happens when we have a, a, a toilet based system is that is that a lot of our waste just gets flushed away and and unfortunately gets into bacteria based processes that don't benefit anything because they're sealed so we need to learn how to use uh, and utilize our waste much more efficiently than that because every bit of waste we produce is going to help the system yeah so we've, we're experimenting with some waste plants that actually help the system, waste processes that help the system. And one is like a septic tank that has a hole in its bottom. <laughs> yeah, it's just a leaky septic tank. So what happens is all the worms gather around the base of it and they all start doing things to the soil next to it. Yeah, and then all the trees start putting their roots into that. And so they start sucking out all the moisture as well and yeah interesting to and Corny's tried different experiments too you know we're just trying different experiments but in the end all the experiments need to be documented scientifically they need to be presented to people in groups there's a huge amount of uh, work that needs to be done in that regard you know to train people and teach people what what is need needs to occur to recover the land and you can see from our experiments already, the co experiments Corny's done and we've done with, with the decomposition and composting processes, you can see that one is a, is a seemingly harmless process but actually causes not the results, doesn't give you the results you want in the long term. And the other one is a, is a much easier to control process um, that does produce the results you want in the long term. So you've got to be able to measure these results in the long term. There's got to be a scientific process of measurement that then needs to be presented in papers, just like a normal scientific process would be, presented to the world in different, to different groups, and eventually more and more people will know what's going on and how to do it, and then, of course, that can take off. Now, now many, many of you, within five years, could have very successful enterprises um, looking after these particular things if you started the process now and documented the process and wrote papers on the process and so forth. But you see, we're a bit lazy and we don't do all of that. We just use what we call empirical data or evidence. And the problem with that is nobody benefits from it. It needs to be a measurable system, something that we can duplicate, monitor and also explain to people scientifically, you see. So while we've done a lot of experiments that show where to go, the reality is there's got to be a lot of more experiments that actually measure the results scientifically in different soils and so forth. Denise? So uh, what does that look like, being able to measure something in a scientific thing? Is it like measuring well, the moisture to, in the ground? Yeah, you need to measure the moisture thing? in the ground at certain levels. You need to measure the soil and its microbiotic 
structure and its mineral based structure okay. so you need to do soil tests you need yeah. to then add the w document what you're adding to the system uh, document what's actually happening by m maybe photographs and yep. also maybe videos in terms of the wildlife and the improvement of the intelligence of the system okay. document that yeah. demonstrate the intelligence of the system and what those particular things are doing to that system and also what plants can grow in that system as a result of all of those mechanisms okay you see uh, yep. and that obviously is going to take a few years yeah um but the reality is that's required if we're going to ever prove to people yep. what what we've al what we already know to be true yeah you see because yep. people are not going to just rely on your word no they are going yep. to want some evidence yep. okay thanks mm. Yep. So, so one of the beautiful things, though, is because we've been doing it now for five or six years, you can go to a place and measure things that's already five or six years in advance of... So you can actually get a lot of data together. You know, here's a two-year hole, here's a three-year hole, here's a five-year hole. What does it do? What's the soil condition like underneath? And all that kind of stuff can all be measured because there are different areas of the property that's got those things, you see. Mm. But it re just requires somebody who's interested enough, <laughs> yeah, to to do the work, you know, to do the work of validation. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So that's the recovery process. That that's sort of like the theory of it, if you like. I don't know if you could call it theory. Really, it's reality present as facts presented to you about you know discussion of the facts presented to you and tomorrow what we want to do with you is show you some of the things we're doing and get you to do some so you have a bit of an idea of the work involved um involved in those processes that makes sense yeah yeah catherine so this is really what a learning center is all about isn't it to doc to do the experiments, document and and monitor and and then and then get that information presentable, yes, and present that to the world, yes, and have people brave enough to travel the world and present that, yes, yep, yeah, yep. Eventually, what happens if you produce the evidence? You'll find people become attracted to the evidence, and they'll want you to speak there. You don't have to go and create that; that they'll ask you to do it. Does that make sense? Yes. You produce the evidence, you put it on a website or something out there, you get it out in public. That's probably as far as you need to go. After that, it'll be self-sustaining. People will ask you, come and speak, can you speak to us about it? And so forth and so forth, and away you go. So it's like any truth, you know. So all the people that come to the learning centre to learn, mm -hmm. this is the type of thing they're going to be doing and also That's wanting well. to know about but also yes in the end the people who stay on the learning center and do these experiments need to have an approach of doing everything scientifically yes. need to have an approach of doing everything so it can be validated you see and this is why with you guys who are working with me already i'm pretty fussy about you know documentation and pretty fussy about you know validating processes and a lot of times everyone who works with me thinks, oh, that's a bit anal or that's a bit, you know, why is he doing that for? Well, I'm doing it for long-term reasons that you don't understand at this point. I know that, it, that in the long term, it, the only way to convince people to change their diets and to change the way they treat the land is to demonstrate to them the destruction process, measure the destruction process, prove it, and then demonstrate to them the recovery process. <coughs> and measure it scientifically and prove it. Mm. Exciting. exciting, yeah, very exciting, very exciting. The only way you, you know, the world today, I'll just uh, have a cough. The world today is like a runaway train when it comes to destruction of the environment. Now, how do you stop a runaway train? Can you see the person driving it or well, the people driving it need to be educated to put the brakes on, <laughs> don't they? <laughs> right, so, so how do you do that? Well, what you need to do is produce evidence 
that give them cause to put the brakes on. So the only way you, you can do that is by, okay, up ahead, there's a break in the line. Oh, that's enough evidence. <laughs> Let's put the brake on, right? You know, that's what you've got to prove to them, the destruction process, where it ends up, and then the recovery process and how to do it. It's no good just presenting a problem and saying there's no solutions. You've got to have solutions to the problem, you see. So you've got to, got to produce a solution. You know, we know what the solution is, but it's got to be proven. So somebody's got to want to take the effort and the time and the energy and the resources and the, and the work done and the documentation and, and be thorough about it and, and make sure that in the end we have the proof. Same applies to medical profession, same applies to the environmental, same applies to any other thing that's going on the planet. It's going to be stopped only by people doing this. No other way. Make sense? Yeah. So that's what we need to do. We can't, we can't, expect, we can't expect things to change just because you had some empirical evidence that you said, oh, I looked at it five years ago and it's, lo and it's a lot better now. You can't expect somebody to come along and say, oh, I'm going to spend a hundred grand doing what you just did after you just tell them that, right? Or somebody spending all their time and their energy and resources, even if they're not spending any money, they're not going to do that unless they have a motivation. You've got to provide them the motivation. That's providing them the proof, the evidence. Yeah? It's the only way it's going to happen. And like I, I, like, like I said at the uh, recent assistant gr assistance groups, there are so many opportunities for jobs in the future, all sorts of jobs that are all about loving recovery of our entire worldwide system, that many of you could start right now if you decided to, but many of you are not because you're waiting for some imaginary person to come along and do it all for you, or you're waiting for some imaginary person to come along and uh, solve it all for the whole world, or it's not going to work like that. Like all change in the whole universe is gradual, is it not? So positive change, even that change that's triggered by the flow of God's love into the soul, can't happen instantly. It's all got to happen over time. Yeah. So how is the environment going to change? Over time, somebody is going to have to come along and prove that what we're doing now is wrong and what we need to do is this. That's, that's how it will change. I'm telling you what we need to do and what, I'm telling you how it resulted in what was wrong. All I'm doing is informing you from my own observation over thousands of years. That's all I'm doing. But at the end of the day, somebody's got to do and go and prove that. I'm too busy teaching other things. I haven't got time to prove that. You follow? Yeah, so somebody else is going to have to do it. Who? So it's going to have to be someone who wants to, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> At the end of the day. Mm. Yeah. So, like, a lot of people look at what we're doing here and they go, why is, why is AJ spending so much time and money and effort fixing his land for? What? What's the point behind all that? Can you see what the point is? Yeah. Yeah. There's always a point to everything I do, right? <laughs> yeah. Pete? I remember when I first came up here, it's like, why would you bloody want to live in a place like this? Yeah. You know, and then you explain that you actually want to go for a, a, a harsh place or a place that hasn't been cared or looked after and actually want to fix it rather than yeah. always go for the nice place and then do more damage in the nice place. Yeah. 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 Which is what humanity generally does, isn't it? Grab a nice place and destroy it over time. You know, in the Middle East, where now it's pretty much deserts, there used to be two 300 foot high trees, forests and forests, food forests. In fact, the original human couple were placed nearby in Turkey, uh, in place now that is so devastated that not a blade of grass will grow. Interesting, huh? That's where the first human couple were. 
in a forest that they didn't have to grow anything to eat because there was already plenty. Yeah. Thanks, Nikki. Would there be um, a bit less resistance in people knowing about, let's say, environmental stuff rather than their own soul Definitely. emotional condition? Definitely. And then if, let's say, some people do this, yeah. or one person does it, whoever, yeah. could that then be a point of reference to bring in all the actual soul-based teachings? Of course. About the soul and God's love flowing into the soul and of course. things like that. You know, they're not going to have to believe in Jesus, are they? Or believe what Jesus says in order to accept your evidence. So, of course, it's going to be a lot easier. Isn't it? Yeah. It just requires people with some long-term goals and long-term thinking, not being shaken, not being shaken from their objectives, being willing to speak, being willing to publicly talk about what they've discovered and also write papers and do enough work to publicly deliver the material for free hoping that some kind of uh, income is going to come into for them to survive in that process which means they're going to require some faith um, it needs people like that doesn't it to do the job yeah mm. good eh yeah yeah, so, so the reason why we wanted to have this discussion with you about the basic principles of the environmental process is we wanted to explain to you the cause of the destruction, the underlying reasons why it's become so difficult to recover, and then what needs to happen to recover it in a practical sense, but also what needs to happen from an environmental sense and a scientific sense in order to present the information to a scientific community and to other people generally that will prove to them that this is the way forward for humanity when it comes to the environment. Does that make sense? Yep. The reality is if you had a forest-like garden in every location on the planet, the reality is the, the forest could produce enough food for everybody on the planet and more besides, of course. There'll be an abundance. Beca and also many of the places that are currently uh, we're unable to grow things on on the planet would would be able to be produce food as well and not only just food but also f food for other living creatures for the entire environment right so so the reality is there's so much potential here it just requires some people thinking out of the box a bit and but it's not, it's not that it's not rocket science is it right it's pretty basic principles that you can see God's already doing through the natural processes. It's a matter of documenting them, putting in some logical sorter and sequence, getting the scientific evidence and presenting that to the world. Yeah. Mm. So that's what we want to do. Or hopefully some of you might want to do that. That'd be good. <laughs> All right. So that's a very basic introduction. Obviously, there's a lot more we could say. You know, there's a lot more going on in the environment than the average person or even most scientists are aware of is the reality. And of course, the human soul has a large impact upon the environment as well. So, you know, obviously there's a lot you could say about that. But but all of that can all be measured and proven. And it's just a matter of getting ourselves in the state where we want to. And we're willing to put our time and energy and resources in it for a period of potentially years. Maybe, maybe 20, 10, 20, 30 years. We might die doing it. Right. Pete, thanks. Just one question on weeds. Like with lantana or blackberries or something like that, is it just with those types of weeds, the process hasn't taken long enough for them to then no longer need to be in the system? What's happening where they want to dominate the entire system for a long period of time? Uh, that's a lot to do, Pete, with the emotional condition of humans, to be honest. Um, we have an attitude of domination of our environment, mm -hmm. and as a result, certain plants that don't by nature dominate the environment, but which uh, have a tendency towards such, will automatically begin dominating the environment as well. And also certain animals and birds and other creatures will also dominate. So you'll get the sensitive creatures and the sensitive plants 
taken out of the system by the dominating plants and creatures and that is all a fact that plays that is played out through our soul condition collectively so controlling that is all about changing your condition not about getting rid of the plants so much yeah as changing the condition yep yeah and that's where you know there's some problems that the scientific process is not going to be able to solve without a scientific analysis of a change of a condition yeah but that's a further advanced idea or concept that most people at this stage on the planet will reject so you can certainly um you can but you can certainly teach the basics couldn't you quite simply yeah be a nice little uh constructive process wouldn't it going around the world talking about this kind of stuff showing them photos and pictures and videos and showing them how how it's all happening and what kind of organism is soil and the da empirical data the measurements that you've made and the scientific measurements and wouldn't it be fantastic awesome. yeah going around teaching teaching some very basic things about recovery of the environment a lot of people want to hear from you a lot of people will because a lot of people even farmers are now having a lot of trouble with recovery of environment having a lot of trouble with the fact that they've got to use more and more insecticides and more and more pesticides more and more um you know recovery uh like substances like minerals and so forth on the ground just to produce the same size crops and um you know you could incorporate issues couldn't you of the issues of uh, developmental issues and life principles based on gmo and what's going on there and why and why gmo while it has some advantages and certainly certainly there's no problem with genetic modification as long as the life principle is retained but as soon as the life principle is lost then you've lost the purpose of genetic modification you follow so you can teach those principles as well as more advanced principles to the basics you can go right the way through to quite some complex quite complex principles without even drawing the soul into the discussion but sooner or later of course the soul is going to have to become a part of the discussion isn't it because the human has the effect on the environment naturally it's going to have to become a part of the discussion but you know that's over time mm. yeah it's good eh? yeah yeah so we thought uh, we wanted to present this material to you this afternoon because we want to give you the um, the idea or concept that it's really important for us to consider what's happened in the destruction of the environment, what we can do to recover the environment, and to look at some very basic things about how to do that. Right? And like I've said, I've only scratched the surface of the subject, but at least for you guys who have not had much experience in anything to do with the environment it's given you hopefully some ideas right and probably for the others of you who have had something to do with the environment yes there's things there that you probably haven't considered right yeah yeah okay that's good thanks guys Thank you.